Okay. So for this week, uh, just some reminders first off. Uh, we plan to have a quiz here soon on chapter 18. Chapter 18 covers installing Apache web server. Okay. Um, so be aware of that. Probably I'll plan for it on Wednesday. Unless I'm not ready for it on Wednesday, then it'll be Monday. Enough of that. It will be in class. Um, the other thing is uh, there is a homework assignment that's out there for next class about uh, FTP and just researching uh, security on FTP. And what's more secure than FTP? So you have to write a paragraph on that. So that shouldn't be too bad. Okay. Um, that's due before class, uh, next class. Okay. The other thing is, is I put this little survey out here. So if you go on Rock, you click on this link, Progress of Class, takes you to my awesome Google form. And this is basically, see, I want to see where you're at because we're going to divide up in groups today, and hopefully, depending where you're at, that's how we'll divide up. Okay, um, so you can go ahead and show that, and then I will uh, begin with my little tip of the day. Okay, I'm trying to have those for, for at least this Linux class, and hopefully for all my classes, but uh, right now I'm just starting it at Linux. All right, so I'm going to show you how to open up multiple tabs in Vim so that you can have multiple documents open in tabs and switch between the tabs. Okay, so. Let's see if I have any files here. I do. All right. So I'll just open up. I forget what this Iowa IWCC file is. It's probably not. All right. It's just that, right? <clears throat> so if you're already in Vim, and it's VIM, and you want to open up a new tab, you just do colon tab new and then name the file you want to open. So you can do student. I think I have one just called student. And then that opens up a tab, which I apparently don't have anything in there. But if you look at the top, you see I have tabs up there. And you can keep opening up new tabs if you want. I guess if that file isn't there, that student file, then it opens up just a blank file, right? So you can keep doing that if you want, colon, tab new, um, something. I don't know. And now I have a file called something, OK? To switch between the tabs, you press G, the G key, and the T key. G. G as in George, T as in Tom, right? And you see how I'm just kind of shuffling through the tabs. Now that'll go forward if you want to go backwards through the tabs. It's G capital T. And that'll take you backwards through the tabs. Tabs are really good if you're cutting and pasting. So let's say you want to copy from one document and paste into another document. Okay? Um, so, for instance, I want to paste this one sentence into the student's document that I have open. Right? <clears throat> so, you can do a Shift V and you go into something called Visualize Mode or Visual Mode. Sorry, Visual Mode. Once you do that, you can press Y. And that's a copy. Y stands for yank, for you're yanking out the text. Right? Then you can just move to the tab you want. And then you could do, uh, I like shift the capital P, but you can do lowercase p, capital P, and that will paste your know, sentence in. And that's how you manage tabs in Vim. Yeah. So kind of neat, huh? So you can do tabs. Um, I haven't showed you guys spelling or anything yet, have I? What do you mean? Like how to use the spelling 
feature. Maybe I'll do that next time, something like that. I can also show you folding. I just learned cool folding, where you can fold text up. So like you have real long text. You want this block of text to be a single line just for visual. That can zip it up right and just fold it right up. All right. Maybe I'm, I'm kind of on a, a Vim kick right now. So next few ones might just be about Vim. But anyway, that's, that's tabs. And then you just close out as usual. And see how it just closes the tab? Just closes it. Let's do whatever you want. There you go. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> yes, there is. I just don't remember what it is. Oh, one thing I did, didn't show you, though. Let's say you want to just open up multiple files all in the tabs already. You don't want to have to do the colon tab new each time, right? And you already know what files you want, right? So I should probably show you that. So I got to see what files I have first. Um, so you do vim dash p. That's it. And then you list the files you want. So let's say I want group, I want shopping, I want employees or something. Then I hit enter. And they're all darn the cutoff up there. And there it is. There you have three tabs. I opened up three. Vim dash P. And then list your files that you want to open up in tabs. And they all open up in tabs, just like that. So that's Vim tabs. That's kind of cool. Uh, I thought it was cool um, in a really geeky, nerdy sort of way, right? All right. Um, let's uh, I'll explain. I want to walk through a few things here, um, and then we'll start on the lab on setting up an FTP server and securing FTP. Um, make sure you take that survey though while I'm talking, okay? I know you guys are usually doing something else while I'm talking, so this shouldn't be too hard for you, right? Um, to take this survey while I'm talking. So. Uh, first thing I wanted to explain was, uh, since we are in a server class, what a server is, and how it works, and what a client is, and how that works, just at a kind of a high level. I don't know if I, I don't think I explained that, and maybe I should, okay? So, what a server is, it is a program that listens for activity on a certain port. With on, on a computer. A port is just a doorway to your computer. Okay? So, for instance, a web server runs on port 80. HTTP, HTTP, right? Runs on port 80. Okay? So, what that means is if you have a web server running like Apache that we set up, it is standing there by port 80. And if anything comes knocking on port 80, it will open up the door and give it whatever it wants, whatever it asks, right? Um, now, you have an opportunity, and hopefully when you worked on the Apache and setting up the web server, you were able to disable that or turn off that service, right? That just means it's not listening to port 80 anymore, right? And then you can turn it back on or restart it. That means it's listening to port 80, right? So what? That's, that's the server side of things. So a client is what you use to connect to a server. Okay? So what client do we use to connect to a web server? What's that? A web browser. Yeah, that's the client. So Firefox, Chrome, whatever else, that's what we use. That's our web client that we use to connect to a web server. Okay? By default, it puts port 80 up there. When you type in google.com or whatever website you're looking for, it goes to that address and goes to port 80 on that server. It comes knocking, it opens up, hey, you want a web page? Here's a web page. And, it, 
and then you view that web page through your clients. That's the way you access it. The same thing works with uh, databases. You have SQL databases that store information and uh, give you information. You, you can use a client to be able to extract that information outside of a database. Okay? The same thing with FTP. FTP is to transfer files from one computer to another. People who create web pages use FTP all the time to upload their web pages to the server so that it can be accessed by whoever needs to access it. So that's why it's important that we learn how to set this up. Um, by default, when you set up FTP, it's not very secure. So um, we'll do some different tests in this next lab to um, first test it out and see how it's not very secure. And then we'll do some things to lock it down. We'll also do, um, we'll also encrypt. Uh, we'll set up some new virtual users and encrypt that file that contains their passwords so that those files can't just be read by anybody. Um, and things like that. Let's see, what else am I missing here? Oh, a lot of things. We talked about shutting down, starting up servers. Um, the other thing I want to talk about was the difference between root and sudo, S-U-D-O. Yes, um, root is an actual user on the machine. That's the administrator. Okay, when you do sudo, you're allowing a user to run a function that normally is run by the administrator. Does that make sense? Okay, in Windows they have a similar feature. It's called run as. Okay, same thing. Where you're just saying I'm allowing this one user to run certain administrative functions. Okay. So that's kind of the difference. As you notice, CentOS, unless you've set it up correctly, you may not have a user that can use sudo. Right? Um, you can change that if you want, but I'm going to let you do that on your own. Okay? It's not that hard. Um, otherwise, you have to switch over to root. You have to use the su command and switch over and become root and change. You can't just run sudo and then the command. Okay? So be aware of that. Ubuntu by default just sets sudo up for you. Okay? So that's why some people have had questions about that. Um, also, if you can't connect your sent, C E N T O S, machine, um, I put some additional instructions on Rock on some things you can try. Okay? First, uh, try maybe shut down the firewall, because maybe the fire instead of configuring the firewall on scent, we'll just shut it down, because that'll make it a little easier. Um, you already have an external firewall running. And then you can also disable uh, what's called CE, or sorry, SE Linux. Okay, it's a security um, system that's built into CentOS that's installed by default and sometimes that could be blocking you from connecting. Okay? So if you uh, are having problems with that and you weren't able to connect your web page, you can follow those instructions and those should be able to help you out. Okay? Any questions? Yes? I just want to go back to the studio thing, which probably yes. minor technical, but I'm wondering whether command, are you temporarily transferred to the root account, or are you just um, given no root power for that one command? You're only given root power for that one command. Now what does happen, it's um, you're given that ability for a set time. So you'll notice if you type the sudo command once, you're asked for the password. If you do it within a, f a minute or two, it doesn't make you type in the password a second time. But if you wait 10 or 15 minutes, 
It'll make you type in the password again. So after the first time, you're given that ability for a short moment, for a few minutes. Yeah. But you never change to root or become root temporarily or anything like that. All right. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Not that I know of. No. I mean, it did shut down over the weekend, but it should be back up. Oh, okay, but all your systems are running. They're up and running. Okay. All right. Run through some of the troubleshooting things I give there. What's that? See what we can do. Okay. Has everyone had a chance to take that survey? Has anyone not taken the survey? <coughs> Take it right now. Okay. Take it. All right. Other than that, I'm going to I'm going to turn on the instructions here for the lab. And then um I don't know why I didn't have that going. Okay, and I need to change this. All right, so I have a Dropbox. I have some instructions there for you. Uh, most, most of your instructions on actually setting up the FTP server will come from your book, Chapter 19. Okay? So my Word document there, though, gives you additional instructions and tells you when to take screenshots to show that you're doing certain things, right? Because uh, what the book doesn't tell you is to connect as this user, connect as this user, look at these logs. I have you do that so that you can track and see when users are logged in, when files are being transferred, and um, it also trains you to be a good uh, system administrator so, so that you can track these things when you're able to troubleshoot. So when someone says, I can't log in, well, you can look at the system logs and see, well, they didn't type the password in right. It says right there that they didn't type the right password. So either they forgot their password or they're type, mistyping it, right? Um, things like that, so that you can be able to troubleshoot things like that. Um, it'll also prepare you for uh, the cyber defense competition, which comes in later uh, this semester, because you'll need to know those logs backward and forward. Now, I will give you some tips. I don't think I put this in my instructions, but this is just a tip. I really don't tell you how to copy these logs, these configuration files, how to view these logs. Right? You should know the commands already how to do that. A few commands that might be useful to you, particularly to view these logs, is tail. Maybe the command head. Right? Um, or less, if you want to use less. That all helps. There's other really cool um, applications that help you. You can also use grep. That might come in really useful, G-R-E-P. Because if you want to just search for a certain part of the log file, grep is really useful to be able to do that. OK? So just some help there so you're not scrolling through a bunch of log files, OK? You can do that, um, but there's easier ways, OK? All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the survey. Everyone done with the survey now? OK. Um, and then I'm going to divide you up in groups. You can go ahead and start or look at the instructions and things like that. Probably going to divide you up into groups of three. Yeah? Yeah. And now it's not working? Is your Apache's what? So it says it's not even installed? What, what is no file or directory? Uh, 
Um, I'm going to have to follow up on that. Go ahead and just install it. Because <laughs> that doesn't take, that's not too hard, right? Um, now let me check. Maybe they, they rolled it back when the power went out or something like that. I don't know. As far as it, they didn't tell me that they did or not. So I'll check on that.